That wasn't fair. <laughs> Alan, you're amazing. And I think one of the things that we have found in the last few months is that youth of this country are amazing. So uh, welcome, everyone. I wish I could be quite as um, eloquent. But my job tonight is to welcome you, and I am. And I'm really thrilled to be here. Uh, we just ended three days of a remarkable conference, Spotlight Health, which brought individuals in medicine and healthcare delivery and NGOs from all over the world in the most passionate display of commitment. I hope you will have the opportunity to attend if you haven't in the past. But one of the things about that part of our program is that it's totally energized us to get tonight and the rest of the week going. I can't tell you sort of the, the energy and the feeling of being propelled into this moment by what just happened uh, with Atul Gawande this morning and Cory Booker, who is eloquent as always, and Ava DuVernay uh, giving unbelievable talks and discussion. Um, as you've probably surmised, we don't have a theme at Ideas Festival. How many of you have been here before? I, just, I should know. OK. How many for, of you is, or is this your first time? OK, I'm going to speak over here. No, over there. Um, we don't have one overriding theme, as Spotlight Health did. Instead, uh, we work to create a tapestry of ideas and issues that when all is said and done across the week, actually do weave together into compelling narratives for your consideration. This year, for all the obvious reasons, we're going to gra grapple with issues as broad as trust in the media and the now ubiquitous social media platforms that deliver information. We're going to examine the ways that design can address challenges of climate change and sea level rise. We will discuss some important questions that challenges the ways we think about boys and girls in society, as well as men and women. What is feminism? Why are people talking about toxic masculinity? Are the brains of boys and girls actually different? How do we build parity across gender, across the sexes? Across the whole week, we're going to address the imperfections that define American ideas today and the ongoing challenges we have faced as a nation since our founding. What will it take to build bridges and cross divides? In this era of hyper-polarization, how does our union become more perfect? We'll also debate the issues posed by globalization, both politically and economically, and learn from the experts about the rise of populism in some quarters and the quest for peace and democracy in others across the globe. Importantly, our hope for the festival and your experience here is that the discussions on and off the dais will give us all the momentum to consider what is at the core of our own value system, what we really need when it comes to leadership at home, in business, in government, in community. Yes, we have a strand of discussions about leadership every single day with amazing leaders in industry, finance, government, NGOs. But we will also ask each of you, because you're all leaders, to apply your own brand of leadership across discussions of deep import. What is democracy? What does it really mean to be civically engaged? How do we have better arguments? And we'll discuss a range of issues through the lens of artistic endeavor. Tonight, one of the events that leads off the festival is a town hall that will engage us in considering our American values through the lens of art, which I hope many, many of you will come to. Later in the week, we will discuss uh, American society through the prism of theater in a new way we've crafted the afternoon of conversation on the stage of the music tent. We hope you will engage openly and eagerly in all these dialogues that will take place here in the next several days. Now, one of our other jobs tonight is to give you some detail for your time here. And as you know, we produce the festival with our colleagues at the Atlantic. And so for a slight change of pace, instead of me, for those of you that know me and those of you who don't, I usually give the logistics handout, I'm going to invite my good colleague, 
friend and collaborator, Jeffrey Goldberg, the irre irrepressible editor-in-chief of The Atlantic, to offer some logistical details that you'll want to pay attention to. And one thing I do need you to pay attention to now is do not throw this away. You're going to need it tonight. Okay, Jeff? So I'm here to read the shuttle schedule to Snowmass for everyone. <laughs> um, we start early, 5 a.m. Um, I'm not actually here to um, give logistics. Um, uh, I know that's surprising to you. Um, Kitty uh, asked me to come and talk, especially to people who haven't been here before, people who are fairly new to this. Um, some, some tips and guidelines and observations about uh, how to get the most out of the Aspen Ideas Festival. Um, you know, one thing that we've talked about a lot, and I've mentioned this in the past, is that it's, it's uh, you know, there's a, there's a huge buffet of things to do here. Um, it's very useful uh, to pick programs, pick discussions that, um, that you're not familiar with, the topics are unfamiliar to you, you'll probably learn more. Um, and if you go to a uh, panel discussion and you really enjoy it, it's customary to tip the moderator. Um, <laughs> just like 20 bucks or, 40 bucks if they're from the Atlantic. Um, I, I want to I point out there's some new things here this year as, as, as there are every year. Um, you're going to see a new face on, on campus, a uh, new person, um, very pleasant looking middle-aged uh, white male in a blue blazer and possibly dockers. Um, I give that description to narrow it down to several <laughs> hundred people. This person, you're going to meet him formally in a few minutes. His name is Dan Porterfield. He's the new president and CEO of the Aspen Institute. Um, when, if you see him and he looks lost and confused, do not help him. Um, this is a very dog-eat-dog -dog festival, and he's going to have to find his way through this by himself. Um, I want to I wanna, uh, make a quick uh, a point to um, some of the scholars and, and younger speakers. Um, this is a big Aspen idea. The big Aspen idea is never pay for food, okay? This is big. You, you, your number one goal is to get out of here without ever paying for food. And if that means um, you have to live on pomegranate juice and hot dogs, so be it. Um, by the way, the pomegranate juice is very delicious. Um, the <laughs> Uh, I also want to talk for a minute about um, the environment in which we find ourselves. You know, we're way up high in the mountains, um, uh, vast forests around us, um, and and uh, you know we share this habitat with various different species. Some of you might not be familiar with. Um, so you could be uh, walking or hiking along one of the paths uh, in, in the woods here into town. You could be in town. Um, you could even be on this campus. And there's a chance that you will come face to face with a billionaire. Um, <laughs> there are rules governing these encounters issued by the state of Colorado that I want to uh, articulate for you. Um, the first is do not run. <laughs> the second is make yourself look as big as possible. <laughs> or if you can't do that, make yourself look as famous as possible in this encounter. And the, the third rule is do not on this first encounter ask the billionaire to fund your documentary on climate change. <laughs> you have to wait to the second encounter before you do that. Um, so let me, a, a, a couple of more points. I wanna, I wanna say a word about marijuana. Um, not a word on behalf of marijuana. Marijuana speaks for itself in this state, quite obviously. Um, uh, this is, uh, it, it's, it's an important thing to know, those of you who have not been here before. The marijuana sold in Aspen is very high quality, high THC level marijuana. I'm, I'm not speaking this from experience. I haven't used marijuana since the Reagan administration, personally. <laughs> Although I'm thinking of taking it up in the new administration. Um, and um, and I'm, just, I'm just offering this as, as is the combination of altitude and the high strength of the, of the Aspen quality marijuana can really be noticeable, especially for speakers. We, we will look out in the audience and I can always tell immediately um, uh, who, is, who has been partaking. Uh, and for instance, right now I can see that uh, David Brooks is stoned out of his gourd. <laughs> It just, you can see it in the eyes. It's all in the eyes. So just, I just want people to be careful. Um, 
Finally, um, you're going you're gonna to hear and experience many amazing things uh, over the week. Um, there are, this is a huge gathering of very smart people um, with a lot of uh, great things to tell you, great uh, points to discuss. Um, but I do want to note, I want to manage expectations. You will walk out of a session from time to time and say, what the hell was that about? Um, and this is fine, and this is fine, because there's a reason that this is called the Aspen Ideas Festival and not the Aspen Good Ideas Festival. Um, <laughs> Um, so with that, just as, as long as you understand that and deal with that, you're going to be great. And with that, I'm going to turn it back to a woman who is not currently high, but I think would probably like to be high at this moment. <laughs> Thank you very much. It's Kitty Boone. <laughs> okay, where are your pass? I am going to do logistics because clearly that wasn't the job that he delivered. Um, if David Brooks on his first day here gets stopped by three security people, which is a fact, and he should be fairly well known around here now, so will you. If you don't have this, you don't get in. We actually take security very seriously, so please wear it. Um, you don't need any other tickets, so your pass gets you into everything. Morning, night, date, town, here. Some thank yous. The Atlantic, David, your incredible team. Jeff, you're okay, but the rest of you are really, <laughs> really fantastic, and we couldn't pull this off without them. So thank you. We also couldn't pull this off without our underwriters, and I hope they are being published on our screen because they really help make this festival move and smart and they have incredible exhibits and I hope you'll take care of, you'll, you'll attend all of them. Our patrons who are wearing yellow lanyards have a special form of pass that's very, very important to us. A portion of their pass allows us to bring 300 scholars to Aspen for ten, over the 10 days. And um, these scholars come from all over the world, as I mentioned. We had a number from Africa at Spotlight Health. We have more from all over the United States, from Europe, from Asia, et cetera, and so, so forth. Um, thanks to them, to the Arthur D Vining Davis Foundation, the Rakes Foundation, and the, um, the Penner Family Foundation, who's allowing us to bring a number of KIPP Accelerator Fellows. Um, it's an amazing amount of generosity you've given to help us do this, because it's the fellows and this diversity that's gonna make our, our experience all the more rich. So thank you so much for that. Last year, we um, started something in honor of our dear friend, Gwyn Eiffel, and uh, we will continue that tradition every year at Ideas Festival. For the first half, we have three Eiffel scholars. I don't know, maybe they could raise their hands in the audience, but um, these are young, aspiring journalists at a time when... <laughs> when we need to trust people who are reporting the truth. Um, and my final thanks tonight, as always, goes to the Bezos Family Foundation, whose support and commitment to the next generation of leaders has brought to the Ideas Festival the most amazing students and teachers for the last 14 years. So today we have 12 high school students um, uh, from around the United States with their teachers. Um, and they're going to be here for a week of leadership development um, and training. We also have, I believe, five students from the African Leadership Academy in Johannesburg, uh, South Africa, thanks to the, the Bezos Foundation. I think quickly, one of the things that we don't talk about here is what they do when they go home. They produce ideas festivals in all of their communities. And just quickly, the NorCal Science Fest, after starting in 2015, now has 4,000 people learning about STEM. The South Texas Ideas Festival, which was founded by Michael Morales on the border of Texas and Mexico, has um, been going for two years and has branched out to bring universities and high schools together, now boast to podcasts, build seminars around civic engagement, and um, their big focus this year is food insecurity in that valley. The Florida League of Young Immigrants, or FlyFest, was founded in 2016 by scholar Deborah Gonzalez, 
A Cuban-American, Deborah wanted to create opportunity for immigrants to have access to resources such as degree validation, information about free ESL classes and legal clinics, and a safe place to discuss their rights. She was 17 when she started that as a Bezos scholar. Two years later, FlyFest has grown to include the Haitian community as well as creating a peer mentor program for recently immigrated students. And in 2018, the South African Ideas Festival celebrated its sixth year at the African Leadership Academy and welcomed 56 passionate young change makers from South Africa, Zimbabwe, and Tanzania for a weekend long we workshop focusing on entrepreneurship, professionalism, and financial literacy. Now I would say those are ideas that go to action. And to Jackie and Mike Bezos, thank you so much for your investment in these kids. Are our Bezos scholars this year right here? And could you stand up for everybody, please? And if experience holds, they're going to ask the best questions in the room, so you better be careful. Um, I'm going to close now with introductory comments of mine. And it's my great pleasure to introduce two leaders tonight for the first part of our formal program. Uh, David Bradley has been uh, two decades leading the Atlantic Media Company, and Dan Porterfield has been two weeks leading the Aspen Institute. <laughs> and I welcome them to the stage for conversation. Thank you so much. Good afternoon. Um, if, if you'll indulge me, I, I just want to start by saying on behalf of the Atlantic, um, congratulations to Dan Porterfield, the 13th president and CEO of the Aspen Institute. Welcome here. Welcome Thank to you, your wife, Karen Herling, who's here in the front row. Yeah. You may not enjoy all of us, but we're going to try so hard. <laughs> so if I may, I want to do a quick primer uh, for Dan as we get going. Um, these are the best friends of the Ideas Festival. Uh, there's board chairs, the uh, members of the board, spouses, high donors. People have been with us for a long, long period of time. Um, and uh, this is the group you will get to know over the years. I hope the audience will forgive me here. Um, you know, the, this, is, this is the primer part. Um, there are two sessions of the Ideas Festival. Um, this is the first session. The second one begins on Wednesday. You know the axiom that you're supposed to love all of your children equally. <laughs> At the Ideas Festival, not so much. <laughs> these, these are our favorites right here. Um, every year during the f uh, winter, we will choose from all the registrations of people we really love, and we bring them here to the first session. <laughs> It's not entirely fair to the second session, because we, we love them uh, too. Um, it's just that they think um, in a more measured way. Um, so one of the speakers commented last year, it's a penny for your thoughts, and you get back change. <laughs> now, if I may, I want to address a few words to the audience. Um, you can't imagine how much rigor of process was put against the selection that yielded Dan Porterfield. Um, the committee, search committee, looked at uh, 200 names. And what I thought I could do is pull back the curtain just a little bit for you um, on uh -oh. the process <laughs> by do how... You, do you have to? <laughs> <laughs> I have to. Um, <laughs> this is the process by which, uh, for a long time, uh, the new CEOs have been chosen. Um, so it's a little bit like a college application. There's the written part, and then there's the interview that follows. I didn't have access to the written part of the current round of applicants. For example, I didn't see Dan's applications. I just went back through old files and grabbed randomly one of the applications. And what I'm going to do is just do a few lines of the short answer in the essay so you get a sense of uh, what was submitted here. Um, 
even though it's old, I should, I'll just call this candidate X um, to respect confidentiality. So these are the short answer questions. Please explain your interest in leading the Aspen Institute. Here's the answer. As a Rhodes Scholar from New Orleans, <laughs> I've always hated jazz. That's it, I'll do pretty much anything to get out of this city. Question, can you detail your academic background? Did you graduate from one of the more selective universities such as Yale or Princeton, Stanford or MIT, Georgetown? No. Please detail any relevant extra... <laughs> Please detail any extra relevant extracurricular activities, such as school newspaper or debate. Uh, answer, for five years I was the managing editor of Time Magazine. Um, let me just jump in, jump in. I looked up Time Magazine. It is apparently a regional magazine published by <laughs> the Meredith Corporation in Des Moines, Iowa. <laughs> and then there's one other. This is the essay question, the one that matters. Um, if you could go back through all time and meet just one figure from history, who would it be and why? Please write your answer in the space below or in a separate attachment. And here's the answer. I have selected Benjamin Franklin as my historical figure and hereby submit an 800 page, 320,000 <laughs> word profile of Ben Franklin for your consideration. With my remaining time this weekend, I also sketched out profiles of Albert Einstein, Kissinger, and Leonardo da Vinci. Uh, candidate X struck me as a, a sweet man, um, so I just, I just checked in and um, lo, these dozen years later, he's still in New Orleans. <laughs> so shifting gears to a, a more earnest, uh, straight voice, Kath and I have known Dan Porterfield for 20 years. He is an incomparably talented man. That's exactly the finding of the search committee. And what I want to do is a few minutes of interview, get him talking about himself, kind of thing you would see in, a, in an interview, so that you might walk away with some measure of the admiration that, that we have for him. So I'm going to save you the resume process. You don't have to read it. Uh, Dan was born in 1961. That makes him 56 years old, turned 57 this summer, graduated Georgetown University, Rhodes Scholar from Oxford. I don't want you to be too impressed with that. Um, here at the Aspen Institute, that's kind of like getting a driver's license. <laughs> it's kind of the least that Dan could do, I think. He has a PhD from CUNY, four year stint, uh, stint with Donna Shalala at HHS, 13 years on the faculty of Georgetown University and in the administration. And then in 2011, at the age of uh, 49 years old, he was selected as the president of Franklin and Marshall College, which is a liberal arts college in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. Uh, it's the, the greatest liberal arts college in America. <laughs> <laughs> and the greatest liberal arts college in America. Fa founded by Benjamin Franklin. <laughs> It was going to be so much easier to deal with Walter. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so just as we get going, I have questions, but is there anything you want to lead off with? That Absolutely. I have a million thank yous to, uh, to issue. It's going to be like the Academy Awards, the music's going to start playing. Um, so <laughs> first, to Kitty Boone for putting this all together. Thank you so much. <laughs> Uh, to you, Jeff, The Atlantic, to the sponsors, uh, then to our board, our board chair, Jim Crown, who's here. Thank you, Jim, so much. Yeah, yeah. Jim and Bob Steele led the search process and did all the investigative background, talked to my high school girlfriends, which you tried to do, but no way, not this year. Um, and um, so thank you both for the process that you led. Thank you to Franklin and Marshall College which uh, graciously supported my aspiration to take what we were doing there to the next level of social impact. Thank you to all of you for supporting the ASP Institute in all the different ways it makes a difference all around the world. Thank you to Karen Hurling and my family, my three daughters, Lizzie, Caroline, and Sarah, are somewhere around here. All this is great, but the most important thing in my life is my family. Thank you for being here. So Dan, let's take me way back. Take me back to your childhood. In fact, tell me about tell me about your mother, born in 1938. Do the story. Yes. Yeah, so, uh, really, to know me, you do have to know my mom, who was born Anne Maroney in Weston, Massachusetts, uh, with a mom 
who was a very serious alcoholic. And so my mom uh, grew up in foster care and for, lived for 14 years in Western Massachusetts with a big family of foster kids in a kind of old fashioned approach to foster care. And she was raised very well there by a caring woman who I only met once, whose name was Mama Theo. And when my mom was about 14, her mother reclaimed her and asked her to move to Baltimore, Maryland. And she joined then uh, her mother, whose name was Jean Posey. Um, my grandmother was a very strong woman. She had stopped drinking. She was to later become a real leader in Alcoholics Anonymous and took me to a lot of meetings when I was young. But at that point, she was uh, in a circus and she was married to a magician. And she was not really yet a competent parent when she claimed my mom. Um, so a couple years passed. My mom had a lot of odd jobs, including being cut in half every weekend <laughs> by the magician. Um, she graduated the very top of her class, won something called the White Blazer at Notre Dame Prep for the top student uh, in the school, went off to college, and in her first year of college, the magician said she did not like that man that she was dating. And she said, you break up with him. He said, you break up with him, or you get out of the house. My grandmother wasn't strong enough to push back. My mom moved out. Luckily, that was my dad. She married my dad at a very young age. They had me at a very young age probably sooner than they should have. Um, my mom then uh, had me and my sister while being at home. My dad worked, and um, seven years later, they realized they were not meant to be. And so when they broke up, my mom was a single woman with no money, two kids, and about half a year of college education. She's married at 16, so she's now 23 years old with two children. <laughs> a little bit older. She's 30 years old with two children. She married around age 20, I think. Okay. And so with half a year of college and two kids and no money, she got a job teaching at a high school on the one hand and put herself into Towson College on the other. And when I was going to doing my homework at the kitchen table in fourth grade and fifth grade, she was doing her homework. When I graduated from, middle, from elementary school in sixth grade, she walked across the stage at Towson College, got her college degree. And like many women who go back to college, one degree wasn't enough for her. And so when I was in middle school, she was working in the day, getting her master's degree at night. And when I was in college there because of her, she got her PhD. And she actually has written about Aspen, Colorado because she became a foremost historian of women in the American West, writing her first book about prostitutes across the West and how the gold rush in involved bringing out the women to work with the workers. Um, and through all that, I was just left with one major massive message, which is that when we invest in affordable education and the supports to allow working people to continue to study and learn, whether that means skills or college degrees or graduate programs, when we invest in education, we make our country better and stronger and help the next generation, those they're raising, have opportunities they can never imagine. Your father is an interesting character. He drove a taxi. Take it from there. My dad, uh, who's still alive, uh, about uh, 78, 79 years old, drove a taxi um, in the day while writing plays at night. And he had his own little theater in Baltimore called Corner Theater, where throughout the 60s, he put on plays that were all about the need for social change. Every now and then, they let me go to one. Once, I think I was uh, on stage with Batman. I was Robin chasing a, a bad rat off the stage. You can figure it out later. Um, he, uh, he, he instilled in me a love of literature, of writing, of creativity, as did my mom. Um, I think I got exposed to adult thoughts early, partly because as a, sing as a child of a divorced family, you developed the coping skills of working with both parents and even negotiating among them, and partly because my parents exposed me to social realities, some very painful at an early age. This is inner city Baltimore. Is this hard scrabble or describe the neighborhoods? Uh, I lived in two neighborhoods that I remember early. The first was a, an entirely African American <coughs> neighborhood on Winston Avenue in Baltimore. We were just about the only white family there. And it was great. It was a normal neighborhood and we had a good upbringing and things were fine. 1968, Martin Luther King was assassinated. Bobby, King was, Bobby Kennedy was assassinated. And my dad's mother passed away. And those three factors ended up sort of precipitating my parents' separation and divorce. We moved across town, maybe a mile, to an entirely all-white neighborhood, into the house that my grandmother had lived in before she passed away. In that neighborhood, 
everybody around us was working for Bethlehem Steel or at Sparrows Point uh, or uh, McCormick Spices. And that was a good neighborhood too. And I grew up for a couple years in this segregated all white neighborhood. I didn't know it was segregated um, until the first black family moved in around 1972 or one, I think. Um, and they were, it was a doctor from Kenya with his wife and two little girls. And there were some in that neighborhood that threw stones at their windows and wrote epithets on their sidewalks and threw tomatoes at their house and um, made other threatening gestures. And my mom, conversely, went up and met with them and brought them casseroles and talked to them and tried to make them feel welcome and introduced my sister and me to the idea that we were all citizens together. Um, people started moving fast. Within six months, half of the block had moved out. And everybody who came in was African American. And then it stabilized. And this street, Sagra Road in Baltimore, today is an integrated neighborhood. It's a great place to live. It, people are welcoming to one another, uh, living together, shared lives. And that experience taught me from my mom that we all have to decide what kind of person we're going to be. You have to make that choice. I tried to make that choice the right way every step forward from that Pull experience. Pull that out a little bit more. What kind of? Well, you know, I really think, I really think that for those of us that have the privilege of being born in America white, we have to make an active choice. What kind of a white person am I going to be? And you make that choice in 1972. You make it differently in 1982. <clears throat> make it differently in 1992. But we still have to make that choice as a society. Those of us born with privilege, we have to be able to try to adopt a perspective where we see the world through others' eyes and empty ourselves of some of the assumptions that make us think that the advantages we have are shared by all. This story does. <clears throat> You see the candidacies of other applicants drifting away right now. <laughs> <laughs> and I so wanted the job. <laughs> T team effort. Team effort. <laughs> this story more goes more to personal character than to, um, well, you'll oh. see. But um, tell the story about you're admitted at middle school to St. Paul's, and your mom takes you shopping. And so. The it was a, a, a crazy and important disruptive experience that I had when I was young. Um, and I've described a couple, so I won't make you sit through too many more. It was when the Baltimore City Public School sent my single mom a note after sixth grade saying, good news for you, this is August, good news for you, your middle school son is going to go to school on shifts. And he can go from 8 to 12 or 12 to 4. Which works better for you, working mom? Now think about that. The complete lack of any accountability of the public school system for the people that rely on that school system to help to raise their kids. And so my mom scrambled around Baltimore and went to all these different private schools and said, you know, does anybody have an opening? We'll take my child and, by the way, pay for him. And so uh, St. Paul's School for Boys did that. They took me. And, um, but in my first day, I showed up wearing what you would wear in Baltimore City, platform shoes like this high in the front and the back, <laughs> checked pants, a white belt, a white bow tie, a red shirt. And they honestly looked at me as the brother from another planet. <laughs> but you know, sometimes you think of these stories and you, th you sort of think, you know, these are hard stories and you, you asked it that way. Um, everybody has challenges in life. Everybody has to face difficulties and work through um, things that didn't turn out exactly the way they want. That's how we get our strength and our perspective. All those Bezos scholars out there, and hereby I said I'd do this to you when I saw you again. So, 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 so all those Bezos scholars, they're all these kids that are here. Yes, they face challenges too in their lives, but they're not sitting around you know, crying themselves to sleep at night thinking, well, I guess I can't do anything. They're taking the risk of growth by coming out here to mix it up with us, talk about big ideas. That, I got that the sort of respect for that from my mom, who didn't lie down when she had to take care of two kids on her own, didn't just work, but said, I'm going to get ahead in life and bring these kids with me. So thank you for asking that question. But now we've got to move on a little bit to like, Life after Baltimore, these people are all going to get up and walk out. <laughs> okay, so we'll do a breathtakingly respectful of the clock. Let's leap over Georgetown University, your work there, and go to Franklin and Marshall. Um, that story has to be part of how you got selected. So you're 49 years old. It's the year 2011. Tell us the state of the union of the campus when you arrived. Well, thank you. So I worked uh, for Donna Shalala for four years at Health and Human Services, and then for Leo Donovan and Jack DeJoya, the two presidents of Georgetown, for, for 13, 14 years. 
And those two, those, those three were really great examples for me about change making in institutions. The respect I have for institutions, which is very deep, came even before that from Father Tim Healy, legendary uh, president of Georgetown, who actually made Georgetown into a national institution. And um, Tim taught me and many others uh, when we were in school with him that it mattered that we, um, if we chose to, translate our empathy for helping others into action and leadership that would affect systems and structures. It's a Jesuit priest who was above all called to minister the needs of individual people. But he believed that America was a, organ was a country built around the organization of the institution. Whether that was um, the corporation, the government, the free press, uh, universities, churches and religious communities, he deeply valued institutions. And if his students, if we would start to go off a little bit too much and talk about all the great things we were going to do alone as individuals, they'd say, forget it. In America, this democratic country with this incredible merger of sort of private sector and public sector, you need to understand how institutions work and try to influence them and try to help them bend towards changing times. So I was formed by that belief. And then when I went to Franklin and Marshall College, and I really very much so wanted to be a college president, have a chance to lead an institution. Um, uh, supported by, again, my wife Karen and our family who had to uproot themselves to move to Lancaster, Pennsylvania, which is a great place, changed their lives. And you know, I don't take that for granted. It wasn't me alone. It was our family choosing to do it together. Um, I found a campus that was extremely well known for academic excellence and rigor that has catapulted all kinds of people that you know into major positions in American life. Wanda Austin, Bronx-born, first-gen kid, became the president and CEO of the Aerospace Corporation, responsible for all of America's space defense. She got a great education at f and Richard Pleffler, who leads HBO and is responsible for that masterpiece, Game of Thrones, he went to Franklin Marshall College. Mary Shapiro, the first woman to, re to regulate Wall Street. Patty Harris is going to give away $50 billion for Michael Bloomberg to serve the, the, you know, the larger human good. All went to this great school. When I hit the ground there, I was just in awe of all they had accomplished and built. But I also went on a big, deep listening tour. And I heard two things. One was that the faculty were saying, we wish we could get a deeper, deeper student body. Many great students, but we wish it was universal. In every class, all these seminars, all these labs, you know, peopled with highly driven kids. On the other hand, they also were extremely um, concerned about the fact that the school, uh, that the diversity of the world was much greater than the diversity of the campus. And in fact, only about five or six percent of the students coming into the school were eligible for federal Pell Grants. So that was what we found. A great school, but it wanted to move in the direction of where society was. And the invitation that came to me as the leader was to help frame the work. And I think that, that that's key part of leadership, is to frame the questions inclusively with everybody, but in a way that activates us towards solutions. So at FNM, our, our approach to dealing with these two questions, an uneven student body and a lack of diversity, was to say, bingo, let's go out and find talent all around this country. Let's triple our need-based financial aid budget. Let's build partnerships with all these great schools and programs and scholarship programs around the country that are getting the job done for low-income kids. Let's show up ready to learn and listen, but also offering scholarships. And let's bring to the campus as many top kids as we can recruit from underrepresented communities. We went from 5 or 6% Pell Grant to 20% sustainable Pell Grant over the course of about four years. More important than that change, and the fact also that we've we tripled our domestic students of color, more important, we tripled our rural students, we tripled our immigrant students, more important than all that, the Pell Grant students have the same grades, the same graduation rate, and are actually overrepresented in, in summa and magna cum laude and winning national fellowships, thus deepening the student experience for all the student body. And that can happen. Thank you. And that, that can happen when people of goodwill, uh, as Dr. King said, put our body and souls in motion for change, but then organize ourselves by framing the question properly and marshalling the whole talents of an entire community to design the solutions, then get after it. Almost more for the Aspen staff than for all the guests. Let me just um, tighten your insight on something. What would have been the wrong frame 
for yep. doing what you did? So I think almost any other frame would have been the wrong frame. For example, I think calling that change social justice would have been the wrong frame. Who's justice? We could debate that for decades. I think that um, the frame of sort of mixing the student payer mix as in, the, in the pursuit of a balanced sort of financial strategy would have been the wrong frame. It would have made it look like the kids were sort of elements of some other thing about financial performance. I think diversity, ironically, was the, would have been the wrong frame. And I am deeply committed to diversity. But the bottom line is that if you're 17 years old, like Markira Jones, who came to my school a couple years ago and now is getting a PhD, or like Alejandra Zavala, an immigrant from Mexico who came to my school and just won a big prize for the art she's doing, or Akbar Hussein, who came to my school a few years ago, having left uh, Saudi Arabia with his family, started life over here as Muslim Americans. You don't want to think that the reason you're walking around the grounds of Franklin and Marshall College is because somebody else said, we need more people of your color here so the other people can have diversity. You need to believe you are there because you have talent. You have gifts and resources and strengths and attributes that will enhance the lives of your family, your community, the whole school and society. I truly believe that's the most empowering message you can get. And, and by the way, when you're working with even a great faculty, if they stare out at a classroom that's changing dramatically demographically, they don't want to hurt kids, they want to help kids. And if they wonder, how do I teach now this very differently composed student body? If the answer is, well, the reason they're differently composed is because you're serving a different agenda than those kids' needs, it's not going to work. But on the other hand, when a faculty member believes and knows that that's a more deeply and uniformly talented classroom, then the job is theirs to change their teaching strategy strategies in order to respond to those kids' talents, which is exactly what happened. Our faculty embraced this effort, and we're so happy that they had deeply, deeply committed students there to, to really create for themselves a great college education. So we'll do one more question. Um, if we went back and did the parts of the story, uh, Dan, we've skipped over, you'd see that he was coaching and mentoring uh, young people when he was in high school. He set up two coaching and mentoring programs while he was at Georgetown that still exist. He went into undergraduate education, uh, both teaching and then president of an undergraduate school. You have devoted your entire life to youth. I don't know if you've looked at us, Dan, <laughs> um, but for some of us, the last time we were in school was the Coolidge administration. <laughs> um, what were you thinking? I'm going to offer two, two thoughts. Um, the first, I, I think I'd like to, I'd like to channel uh, my mentor again, Father Tim Healy, uh, who had this beautiful line that I carry around and quote a little differently each time I say it. Um, but he said, uh, the young dream and the old teach. And in that mystery comes a tomorrow that we who are older will not see, but will have helped to shape the lives and work of our students. And I believe that all of us are called to be educators and mentors to the young. Every single one of us, always, until we say good night, our human um, calling is to invest in the young. Second point, I think that the Aspen Institute is this great global force for good that Walter Isaacson and all of you helped to build into this incredible resource, but our best days in terms of social impact and change making and improving the quality of life for the one and the many are still ahead of us. And what I'm hoping to do with you together, the, go ahead, <laughs> uh, uh, what, what I'm hoping to do with you in partnership with you together is to identify what is it that we can do, what can we do building on this incredible tradition that we have here to promote human flourishing in all the ways that has to happen, intellectual, personal, social, as citizens, as members of the human family together, all called by the example of those that have come before us, including Walter Isaacson, especially Walter, to make this institute as change-making and important and difference-making and results-oriented as it can be. Not just for us, of course, but for the entire country and the entire world. And we are today at a moment when it feels like some of the for centrifugal forces are pulling us apart.
But the truth of the matter is, it's the centripetal calling that we all feel to be one that this institute can enact in still more dramatic ways by focusing on framing problems and solving problems in a way that helps all. And thank you so much for your support. Being a part of it. Thank you. What indeed is the big idea? We need to be willing to do the genuine experiments that will learn the answers to the question of what works and what doesn't. Resolve to make sure today's young minds are nourished completely and that their spirits are encouraged to fly. Now that's a big idea. If science is communicated by showing the big ideas, if science is communicated by showing the exhilaration of discovery, wow, it comes to life. I was told that at Aspen, big ideas are best delivered wearing flip-flops. <laughs> if we get rid of our inhibition, I think that we need to start competing. We cannot bomb ideas out of people's heads. So my idea, not so big, but just, you know, big enough to you is this. Let's start treating museum as, museums as the R&D departments of society. Every year I come and I watch everybody give their ideas, so I was so excited to get up here and present my own. In sport, my big idea is that players own the game. If we're going to tame the world's wicked problems, we need to be much more ambitious, much more disruptive, much more democratic in the way we innovate. And I think that is the lesson I take away. Uh, the future is not preordained. As I look to my left, I look to my right, I look at the people around me, and I think they may be right about their beliefs and ideas. Maybe I should listen to them. Maybe I should find common ground. You know, it's a real responsibility, I think, on all of us to be open to learning new things, because you can't really decide these cases in an intelligent way un unless you make a commitment to figure out all the things you don't know about. My big idea is that we face a crisis in empathy and that we can cure it with conversation. Nobody's telling you what to play. You're just getting up there and you create. And if you can take that into other areas of your life, I think you live a healthier life. Everyone here has hundreds of great ideas. Everyone needs a context in which those big ideas can come out. But people don't need training to create big ideas. They have big ideas all the time. You are self-filtering your big ideas. If you believe in yourself and you have a dream, anything can happen. Democracy is a contact sport. Everyone gets bruises, even the winners. And the kind of bickering we see today is not only unproductive, it's cowardly. If you don't have the guts to focus on ideas and stop tearing down individuals, you belong in the stands, not on the field. Okay. So, what you just saw were snippets of big ideas that are presented from the stage on this evening over the last 14, 13 years. But in our 14th year, we're going to do something different. We're going to ask you to give big ideas and we're gonna ask select people to tell us where ideas come from. And to that point, I'm going to introduce to you a wonderful partner to the Aspen Institute, uh, Fred Dust, a principal at IDEO, an incredible design thinking firm, to lead us in conversation with select presenters here and then with you. So, Fred, will you come I'm to the right stage? Here. Thanks, Kitty. Um, everybody, if you can look on your seat, uh, there's this little pink slip. Um, uh, can you find it? Good, you got it, perfect. So I'm gonna just kind of show you how we're gonna be using these during the next kind of sort of 20 minutes or so. So I'm gonna ask you a quick question, which is who in the room has really experienced what we would consider like the eureka moment, this unbelievably powerful immediate lightning bolt around like an idea, where you just know it's like you had a brilliant idea. If you have, can you raise your pink slip 
right? You guys are being a little humble, but it's like, it's like, like not so much over there, but like, a, of course the Basel scholars have all the ideas. Groovy, thanks, I appreciate that. Um, fantastic. And then in those people who raise their hands, I'm curious, um, who felt like that idea actually changed their life? If, they, if you felt like that changed your life, raise, your, raise us up. Okay, little, slightly fewer, but, but actually luckily everybody up here too. Um, and then lastly, who actually felt like that idea might have changed the world? Raise your hand if you feel like that's right. Okay, so that's the premise of what I want to talk about a little bit this morning or this afternoon is that um, we're IDEO, we're a company that actually kind of specializes in big ideas. People come to us all the time for that. Um, at the same time, one of the reasons I'm so happy to be here, Kitty, is that um, I've been coming here for years to find big ideas. Um, and one of the things that I've realized over the years of spending time here and spending time in my other life is, rec is recognizing that ideas, big ideas just don't happen. They just don't come. They just don't arrive and show up. In fact, ideas, big ideas, are actually nurtured, they're fostered, they're engaged with, they're raised. And, what they're, and they're raised by communities. And I think that one of the things that, for those of you who are new here, will begin to realize is that this is a community that supports and sponsors and builds ideas. Um, and so the important thing is not necessarily having big ideas, but being able to find the big ideas where they are. Um, and that's what we want to talk about today. So what I'm going to do, and what we decided to do, is we're going to bring up four. There were five, but unfortunately, Brittany, who um, uh, was this amazing scholar um, at Rutgers, is on a plane, as happens. So she's not going to be here. But I'm going to bring four different people up, one at a time. And I'm going to ask them one, what, two questions, really. One question is, Tell us about a time that a big idea might have changed you, changed your life, changed your path. And then the second is, how did you know it was a big idea? Um, and then I'm going to ask them to give you a challenge they're facing and hopefully get ideas from you in the audience. So with that, I'm going to bring Jeff, which I think, it sounds like you're custodial here. Is that right? Yeah, come on up. It's like, it's like, it's like you run the campus. Is that right? Yeah. Yes. yes, yes. <laughs> come on up and sit here. Yeah, why don't you sit over there? All right. Um, <laughs> No, not really, uh, editor-in-chief yeah. at Atlantic, yeah, exactly. Yeah, also. Yeah, exactly, yeah. Also. And, also, and and take care of other things. Also. Um, Jeff, I, I just love to kind of kind of start with that question. So it's like, as you've been thinking about it, and we've talked a little bit, like, what what's a big idea that either shifted you or shifted you in the space of journalism or elsewhere? But, and this, this is, a, it's a good question because it only came out when we were speaking um, the other day. Um, and the big idea, the big shift in, in my life came about two years ago when I moved from 25 or 30 years of writing to being the editor of the Atlantic, and I realized this is going to get a little meta, but but the the Atlantic itself is the idea, uh, you know, and 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 Stu being one of the people, and most of the stewards of the Atlantic are in this room, starting with David Bradley, uh, being the steward of a magazine that was founded to be a magazine of ideas. Again, this is going to get meta. Uh, is is the transformation of when I realized that that the the job is to. Uh, is to create a space where people in America and beyond can actually debate with each other. That, that's an enormous responsibility, especially at a moment of, of national fracturing. We, we, we talked about this for, for a minute. Um, you know, the magazine was founded 161 years ago by Ralph Waldo Emerson and Harriet Beecher Stowe, Oliver Wendell Holmes, and Longfellow, and, 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 and Pantheon, right? Um, and, it was, and it was founded... Um, and embedded in the opening manifesto of the Atlantic is a contradiction and a, and a mystery. Um, the contradiction is that it says the the demand of the Atlantic be the exponent of the American idea, but they don't define what the American idea is. They leave that, I think, for all of the journalists who came after to figure out what that what that means. Um, the contradiction is that they want debate. They want to have. Uh, arguments in the Atlantic, but this, was, these, this group was also a group of, of ardent abolitionists, right? Um, and so there were some ideas, slavery, right. that was never gonna, it was never gonna right. find its advocates in the pages of, of the Atlantic. So, so, so the difficulty of this, once I, once I began to, and I worked at the Atlantic, I mean, I was at the Atlantic for 10 years before that. Once I really started thinking about what that is, I thought about what a unique mission this is, um, and, and especially at a time like this, when it's not 1857, right, right. obviously, but, it's so not I, the greatest year yeah, in, in American curious, history. Like, if, if, when, when that realization came, like, how, did that, how did that change the way you engaged? Like, was there something else, or was it, is it just a, a new way of thinking about what your mission is? Um, you know, you know it, it, makes, it makes 
it makes life easier in a way when you have the clarity right. of that. I mean, look, our mission has gone way beyond just being the exponent of the American idea. Uh, we have a global reach now in, 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 in ways that we didn't have in, in years past. Uh, but it, it, it's, it's a wonderful organizing principle. And again, you know, it's a team of people who are really mission driven. And the mission right now is incredibly, incredibly urgent. And so, um 161 years, that's what you said, is that right? So, so how, do you, how do you know it's a big idea? So like one of the questions that I want to think about for this group is like, so what, what, what sort of proves to you that that's a big idea? It's anyway? alive. I mean, is, it's a lot. I mean, it, it, thing, it, right, it lit, not only is yeah. it alive, it's stronger than it's ever been. It has more, we have tens of millions of readers, thank, thanks to the internet. Right. I very rarely thank the internet, but, <laughs> um, but thanks to the internet, we have tens of million readers in a way that we, we, we right. never had. Um, it's not alive on its, on its own. I mean, I have to, uh, you know, uh, credit where credit is due. David Bradley and Catherine Bradley spent the last two years making sure that, last two decades, making sure that, that the Atlantic would survive to this day, and, and we're very appreciative of that. Um, but the fact is, they, 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 it, once you figured out the, the, the key, once they unlocked that, it, 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 it did survive because there is value to having a place where, let's use the, just the American right, context, right. where Americans still talk to each other past the boundaries of tribe. In a period of retribalization, the big idea is that we are a country organized around a creed, not around uh, an ethnic or religious or right. racial tribe. And of course, we are right now in the middle of that struggle and, and, and therefore, you know, the urgency of that, that central idea invented in the heads of people like Ralph Waldo Emerson, you know, so that, that I, lives. I, this is going to get us to what I think is the challenge you're going to put out to this, okay. this audience. And so I, I just want to sort of say that as I was talking to you the other day, one of the things I realized, and I think this is one of the things we should keep in mind as we're thinking about what are big ideas and the things that we're out there looking for is that, and so this is the one thing I've learned for you, which is that big ideas can be old. So I didn't mean to like that, it's like it's an insult. But it's like, but the reality is like big ideas don't have to be new. That in fact, some of the best ideas we have are old institutions. Oh, no, if, if, an, if, an, if, a, if an, let's not call it an old institution, okay. <laughs> let's just call it um, a venerable institution. A venerable institution. Doesn't li if the people who are stewarding it don't listen to the DNA, yeah. don't understand, you know, you don't, you don't want to be a museum of journalism, right? You want to, yeah. but you want to be informed by the past in order to guide you to the future. It's a, it's a huge competitive advantage, by the way, if you actually worse, if you actually had Frederick Douglass writing in your pages, yeah. it kind of gives you a hint about what you should be doing. Totally. Yeah. So can, can, with that, then, can I actually ask you to put the challenge out to the, yeah, the sure. audience? And what I'm going to ask you to do is, uh, Jeff's going to put a challenge out to you, and again, I want you to do the same thing. If you feel like you want to help, if you feel like you believe that you can actually engage, if you feel like you have something to give, if you feel like you have an idea, then we're going to have you hold up the, the slip. And by the way, we're going to be recording this. So. Right. And so you put the challenge out and then watch yeah. the crowd. So, so the, the a question that I get, um, I think David gets, Bob Cohen gets, uh, the people who, 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 who run this thing currently, we, we get a lot, is how do you reach, as, as, a, as a member in good standing of the dreaded MSM, the mainstream media, which by the way, I'm very pro MSM, <laughs> um, uh, how, do you, you know, how do you reach the 30 to 40% of Americans who for a various various reasons, um, no longer trust the establishment press to tell them the truth. Um, it's a question I don't have the answer for that. I, I, I tell our staff, we double down on our commitment to the enlightenment value. There is such a thing as empirical truth, and we try to be as careful as possible, and we put it out there. We acknowledge our mistakes when we make them. Um, but but it, is, it is a mystery, and I don't think... Look, it's, it's journal, journalism is the core of this, but the mission is to, uh, is to recognize that there is a single American uh, idea governing all the other ideas. How do we get the 30 or 40% of Americans who have given up on this idea uh, uh, of the mainstream media, how do we get them to pay attention to us and understand that, though flawed, we are trying to do something good for democracy and good for the country that we all love? So can I put that out to you? So everybody, it's like, it's like, so how do we actually think about engaging the, the piece, the part of America that's not engaged into the, into the philosophy? And specifically... Not only engaged, but also hostile to some of right. the values that we so stand the, for. So the people who have ideas in the audience or actually have passion around this, I don't want you, like, let's go revival on this. I don't want you just to hold this up. Like, stand up. Let's actually, like, see you guys. Like, come on. If you have an... One, two, one, two, three, four. We have four ideas. Or, oh, and then there's a lot of people who are standing. Um, Jeff, do you want to call on someone? Do you want to ask? Sure. Well, she, she was she, dancing you, you enthusiastically. Up, so yeah. yeah. It's like <laughs> I, I want the enthusiastic it's like, uh, first. I, there's not here. I can cost you mine. 
Hey everybody. Uh, um, so, for a skeptical part of America, they'll probably likely say the cliche term, I'll believe it when I see it, right? right. So, you show them a picture. I'm, I'm a millennial, I'm on Instagram, I'm on Facebook, but that's kind of older, but still. Um, <laughs> and I noticed that if I post a photo of someone especially, it gets far more likes and attention than photos of words and other, any other thing. So, one, photos, engaging photos. We all are attracted to beauty, aesthetics, and anything that is like symmetrical. Secondly, ask questions so they can um, kind of explore their own mind instead of trying to push ideas on them first. Make them um, interrogate and investigate within themselves and dig deep there. Thank you. Thank you. you got it? So, you got photos. You actually have to like get a little more stylish and beautiful, and you might actually have her post photos. I think we're pretty stylish I, I don't and actually, beautiful. I don't, by actually, I'm not sure if you should actually yeah. post the photos. All right, I'm going to let you go down now, and I can bring up the next person. All right, Thanks great. so much, Thanks Jeff. So much. Love to Thank, take you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> All right, Jen Palka, can you come up? So Jen Palka, for those of you who don't know, she's the founder of Code for America. She actually runs Code for America and is the, was the deputy CTO of America. And at what White House was that, Jen, just so I know? <laughs> Thanks for asking, Fred. <laughs> uh, I worked for President Obama. Okay, so Jen Palka. Uh, so, uh, so Jen, same question. Like It's like we're looking for big ideas that change the path of the things that you might have done um, in the world of really technology government. Um, I'm really curious. Like, what, what was the big idea? Yeah, so, I mean, I thought we had a big idea, and I don't think it was a small idea, but then we've been working on it, and I think really it sort of led us to a bigger idea. So the original big idea was, hey, we're living in the digital age, and yet government is, what, four or five decades behind. If we help government update their technology, maybe they can serve people better. So in doing that, um, we really learned a lot, and it's probably easiest to explain how we learned it by telling you kind of how I came to it. Um, I has, was away in DC um, kind of after our third year and we basically were doing these programs that were limited to one year and we would work with city, county, and state governments in these projects that were just radically different from um, how government normally approaches problems. So the framework was, and I don't need to tell you this at IDEO, but um, user-centered, iterative, and data-driven. And so when you do projects that way, it goes much faster, it's actually much cheaper, and you end up with these services that people can use that are kind of delightful to use instead of a big groan. Um, so we were limited to a year, um, but I came back from being at the White House for a year, and one of the teams had decided that their project would not be limited to a year. They were actually still working unpaid, <laughs> on food stamps and the delivery of food stamps in California. And what what found out was that they had discovered that it's very hard to apply online. The application form online that the government had built with contractors took over an hour to use and it didn't work on a mobile phone. Right. So people really couldn't apply. And they had made this very quick, simple, mobile first application. It takes about seven minutes to apply. Um, but they decided to check and make sure that actually helped solve the problem. So they started text messaging all of their clients and they found out that in fact that didn't necessarily right. help because people had all these other problems. You would have to get an interview, you would miss the call, you would start over in the beginning of the process, people would lose your documents. And they realized that what they had was data that could help these counties understand the policy and operations problems that they were... So talk about that, because yeah. it sounds to me like one of the things that's happened is that you've kind of, there's been an evolution in the idea, that the, the, the way yeah. the idea has changed now and the yeah. way it lives is different. Talk about that. Yeah, so we thought this was really about fixing government technology. What we realized is that it's actually about fixing government itself. And what you have to do is start embracing all of the ways that we can understand policy dramatically differently, and not just the policies that we want to change, but actually the process of making policy from the view of the user on up instead of from the top down. And it's actually working. So having this data, like in this, in the case of food stamps, it's, we've enrolled hundreds of thousands of people that weren't able to enroll before, but we're working on all this policy and operations level with government in a much, much deeper way than we ever had before. And do you think that's gonna make policy move faster? Is that the... It's absolutely making policy move faster, but more importantly, it's sort of closing this implementation gap. You have all of these policies you know, it started for us in food assistance, but then moved on into the criminal justice world, where you, you have the policy, 
but the implementation is so far from it that you don't actually get the outcomes that without you intend. It, right. So with that, I think actually what I'd love to do is kind of throw your challenge out to the audience, because I think it's actually really related. So if you wouldn't mind kind of uh, going out to them and see if you can get ideas from these guys, if that's cool. Yeah. So I think the real challenge is that we've seen really the ways that you can make policy making work better. Policy and operations of government, really sort of the whole service. Um, but people, and this is much like what Jeff said, they don't believe it. People have given up on government. And we really need a new narrative, a narrative that understands how, uh, that this government is definitely, I don't, I don't like to use the word fixable, mm -hmm. but it's certainly improvable. And we shouldn't be walking away from it because it's huge. Right. Uh, Dan talked about institutions, it's so important. These institutions actually outweigh, there's so much acting at such a higher scale, greater scale, than the social enterprises that we have to fix government. I mean, all of charity on safety net issues is about $42 billion in this country. Government is at least 11 times that in spending on those issues. So if we could make government just 10% more effective, we could double the impact of all philanthropy, but how do we get people to believe that it's fixable and invest in making government work in a digital age? So Jen, so I'm gonna throw this out there because I wanna make sure it's, it's clear, but I, I think so. I think the request here is like, it, it is sort of similar to what Jeff was saying, which is that it, what would allow us to kind of imagine a narrative that makes us believe that government is fixable at this point? The US government, I think you're talking about. I'm talking about the US, but I yeah. think we have tons yeah. of partners around the world. Right. And I think that that narrative is gonna to have to come from people with widely different political views coming together and saying, we might not agree on everything, but we can agree on this. Okay, so I'd like to go back to the audience again. Um, who has an idea or a thought about how we might actually fix the narrative around the way government might fix itself, basically, or kind of like cure itself? Are there ideas? There's one, who else? There, over there, stand up, I'd love to see it. There in the back, please stand up. Are there others? One over there. You got one. Please back there. Stand up. Um, I just want to see you, just so we can see you. Would you stand up as well? Um, so we've got about five or six. Jen, is there someone that you'd like to call on? How about how about how about I'm gonna the woman who just stood up, if that's okay. And, and here, yeah. It's like, you know, what, what's your idea? This is actually an idea I had a while ago that seemed like a major pipe dream, but. Um, we heard earlier today about how important it was to rural communities, and I originally grew up in a rural community in Appalachia, so let me just say that, that when a policymaker actually came, that they were more supportive because they felt heard. And I thought in a digital age, why is Congress always meeting in D.C.? Legis state legislatures only meet part of the year. Could there one year out of each of the, you know, the four years of a term could Congress meet in a different part of the country and be closer to the constituents instead of the funding machine and the lobbying machine in DC? That's it. I love that. Thank you so much. And I, I will say, what you're saying is kind of core to what we think about, which is like putting this stuff back into the human center of this country, right? And then having those conversations there. I think that's a pretty good start. Are you happy with that? Yeah, I think okay. it's, I, I would agree. It's kind of all about proximity. You gotta get close and that's how you solve the problems. So you guys get meet up afterwards. Thanks, Jen. <laughs> <laughs> Two more, John Haugen. Yes. So um, John Haugen actually um, is a VP and a GM of 301, which is the, the um, venture arm of General yes. Mills, right? Yes. Um, and so same thing. So we just heard from journalism. We just talked to really technology and government, um, business. So like, how does how does business think about this? Like, what, what was what was a big idea for you that kind of came down the path that that changed the way you might have thought about business? Yeah. So a number of year, years ago, I was tasked with finding the next round of big ideas for General Mills. And uh, General Mills has been around for 150 years, which is a long time, I guess, uh, relative to the Atlantic, I guess we're just a young pup. <laughs> but, um, you know, and I had a team that was dedicated to leverage the best consumer insights, the best technology, the best routes to market, sales expertise, supply chain, et cetera. And the story behind that isn't so much about what went well, it's really where we struggled. And what we found is we really got into it and we really sought to understand what makes big ideas and what makes great ideas. What we found was that big ideas start small. Um, big ideas take a lot longer to develop 
than what we had modeled as a company. And I, I came to, to learn what I call the five to seven year overnight success story. Anybody who's started a business, I think can resonate with that. But more than anything, there was a, a secret muscle, special muscle that we found with entrepreneurs was very, very difficult to replicate in large companies. And it was that, that intuition, that passion, and that energy, and that vision that entrepreneurs had. And so I, I personally became obsessed with really understanding what makes these entrepreneurs tick, and why is it so difficult to replicate that in a big company setting? And so what we did is, uh, instead of you know, going and hiring consultants and doing more strategic planning, we did something I think is kind of old school. And we actually went out and we just spent a bunch of time talking to entrepreneurs. Hmm. And we asked a really simple question, how can we help? And we wanted to learn about what uh, makes them successful, but really where, where are they lacking? And I think, you know, I'm not a big tennis player. There's probably a lot of tennis players in this audience. But um, I know that when I play tennis, I know I'm a lot better on my forehand than I'm on my backhand. And what I came to realize... Totally lost on me, by the way. So it's like, it's, I don't yeah. play anything. But yeah, yeah. It's, it's awesome. what, what I came to realize was... Uh, is anybody tracking with me? Yeah, yeah, no, it's right. um, what I came to realize is that new business creation is not the forehand strategy of big companies who are built on scale and processes and systems. Mm -hmm. But if we come up out it the right way, we can take their passion and their energy and their vision and help them scale that to reach more so people. So then what did you do with that aid? So uh, I, went, I went back uh, to our management and what happened next was either gonna be a big idea or frankly probably a career limiting move. Because I said, <laughs> we've got a group of people focused on new business development here. And I think instead of us going out and trying to create the best ideas, I think what we really need to do is work on saying, how do we let the best ideas in? And that became transformative for our group uh, because we then really let those entrepreneurs play to their strengths and then bring the resources and capabilities and investment to be able to help them flourish and accelerate. You know, it's funny because I, I, what I took from your story, John, was really the notion that sometimes the best idea is not to have your own idea, but to help somebody else's idea. There's a kind of like a nature of kind of like a generosity and, and, and a trade in that, which I think is really um, valuable. Yeah, and I think that's something, frankly, uh, a lot of people, so we, so we went and we essentially flipped the model. And instead of creating these businesses and these ideas ourselves, uh, we went into the marketplace and now we partner with early stage entrepreneurs and combine that investment capital along with those capabilities. But I will say that many were skeptical when we did that. And right. so um, I think that's where we really had to spend a lot of time and not frankly asking for a lot in advance. Uh, uh, in right. exchange uh, with them at and, the time. And, and kind of giving. So I think you have a challenge that you'd like to put out to the audience. Is that right? It's like, and I'd love you to throw it out if you Yeah, want. let's go. So um, I think, you know, what, what I've learned over the course of the last several years in building the work that we're doing within 301 Inc. is really the focus on business being relational instead of transactional. And I think that's, as we went to really build uh, authentic relationships. You know, not everything is a give get, and and frankly, we've tried to 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 give more than we receive, and and we've mentored a lot of uh, locally. Um, I live in Minnesota, um, so we've uh, we've lived, we've uh, helped mentor a lot of uh, local entrepreneurs, and and we sponsor a lot of new business development competitions. We, we're doing things with schools as well, and and I think for us, uh, as we think about what the future, the future is going to need to be collaborative and where we play to our strengths and where we can work with early stage entrepreneurs to help them grow their business. And so um, in Minnesota, we've, we've got a tradition, it's called the potluck. And uh, whenever you get invited to potluck, what's the one question you ask? What should I bring? <laughs> and so, um, you know, so um, I've learned over the last couple of years, I think what we need to bring to the party, and I would just ask in exchange to the audience here, what can you bring to help the collaboration and, and the partnership in terms of helping these new businesses grow. So really what I'm hearing is basically um, a question which is like how might you interact uh, better and like engage better with kind of with smaller businesses or smaller smaller communities, is, is that right? So like That's how right. might be, so, right. so do anyone have any thoughts around that? Like, quickly, I'd love to see like people, one over there, can you, can you stand? Someone else, anyone else? There's, uh, there's, uh, there's one behind the camera. Uh, anyone over there, Bezos scholars, anyone have, a, have thoughts about how, I, okay, I think we're gonna go with, the, with you. 
There's got to be more business ideas I'm, around here. So. Seriously. Um, hi, I'm Brooke Van Rokel with the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, and our big idea is to embed health into ESG measures, so environmental, social, and governance measures. Um, these are things that companies report on and things that investors pay attention to. And given the high cost of healthcare and also that being a potential risk factor for companies, we think we need to start measuring it. So to embed health into ESG measures. Thank you. Yeah, it sounds like you actually should talk, definitely. So uh, there, there's a reception just for you guys to have a conversation. So there's one more who I want to bring up. Thank you so much, John. I'll take that. It's like... <laughs> Hank Willis Thomas, who's a conceptual artist. I'm so happy to have Hank. Thanks, Mom. <laughs> <laughs> um, Hank, I'd ask the same question, like talk about well, an idea that it influenced you. First of all, thanks for making me last. Yeah, that's what I, I, I realize that you should probably call this Aspen, Aspen Ideas Fest. I, I, first of all, you, my mind has been blown so many times that I have to bring up my phone, which I always have anyway. Yeah, yeah I know. But <laughs> um, I, 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 it came to me just a second ago, literally get people high, blow their minds, and then ask difficult questions. <laughs> Like, and I'm like, what Sorry, am I supposed Kitty, to? the secret's out. How am I it's supposed like... to start? <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank um, you. Thank you, and thank you all. Um, I have, um, I can never answer any question simply. Right. Um, so um, I have, uh, my, my, first I say, us is them and they are us. Uh, then love over rules. And then I think most importantly, that I am who I think I am. Um, Who's the greatest? Hello? Who's the greatest? Who's the greatest? And what's amazing <laughs> to me is what happens yeah, it's like, yeah. after someone says, I am the greatest, um, Muhammad Ali still, three years after his death, is the greatest. Um, and I am who I think I am, so I might be a superhero um, if I am in my own, in my own eyes. And... Um, I realized one day, I used to say I'm an artist, and I said I'm a person, and um, maybe um, I realized that as an artist, we live in anachronistic lives. We live in the future. And um, that um, without art, there is no culture. Um, and without culture, there is no humanity. And so essentially, art and humanity are indivisible. And um, great art allows us to imagine the in, in, in unimaginable. And if we don't apply creative ideas to our most complicated problems, um, we actually will be wind up repeating some of the... And something that you said to me, I think yesterday we were talking, was that, the note, that, that basically the idea that it's art lets us practice the future. Is, and, and I think I'd be really curious to have you talk about that a little bit. Well, there's an artist from um, South Africa whose name's Nicholas Lobo. He said, uh, we have to live in tomorrow before we get there because that way we won't be surprised when we get there. He said, in South Africa, post-apartheid, the problem was that people weren't living in the future they wanted. So when freedom came, they didn't know what to do with it. Mm. Um, I, I was here at, at Aspen Ideas in 2015, and that's where my real big idea came, is that um, the key to the survival of our species um, actually is here in this room. Um, because between art, commerce, policy, and education, um, we can solve these major problems. We were able to put uh, a person on the moon um, in less time than we've been able to um, figure out how to solve uh, battling fossil fuels. Right. Um, and what if we took the same um, collaborative approach to solving our society's problems um, to, uh, as we did to landing someone on the moon? So my friend Eric Gottesman and I started this organization called Four Freedoms. Um, and our goal is to put critical discourse into political discourse through fine art thinking. And if, if uh, legislators thought of themselves as, as artists and creative people, um, and creative people saw themselves as civic leaders, I think we might actually find new approaches to solving our 
So I, I think you're here this week to explore a specific problem, if, if I'm right. So I was hoping that you would actually kind of throw the challenge out to the uh, audience. Like, what, 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 are you, what are you thinking about? Well, um, it's funny. Um, it changes from moment to moment. <laughs> That's what um, happens when we're, when you're but, high. Um, the, yeah, it's, I, it's, for some reason last year, I decided to read 1984 again. I can't <laughs> remember why. Um, and it's, uh, there was a line in it that haunted me. It said, who controls the past controls the present. Who controls the future? Who controls the present controls the future. And that means really the storytellers are the ones who allow us, you know, we are who we think we are. Someone tells me I'm this and I believe them. That is the reality I'm living in. Um, and my friend Paula Crown here has a new piece that she put up outside of the, um, the gondola at the, at the base of the mountain. And it's called Solo Together. And it is a call to action. Um, it's a call to action to each and every one of us. It's a call to action that defines what Four Freedoms is about. Um, and I'm just going to jump into my question right, for everyone. Go for it, please. Yeah. Um, because if you, who here might define themselves in some way, shape, or form as an artist? Raise your hand. Raise your hand. Keep your hands up. Who here, um, in one way, shape, or form, considers himself a scholar or an educator? Keep your hands up. Who here, in one way, shape, or form, considers himself a business person? Okay, who here in one way, shape, or form considers themselves a policymaker? Wait, I can't, is everyone keeping their hands up? <laughs> I cannot tell. Well, Four Freedoms is actually in the midst of trying to do the largest creative collaboration in the history of America, where we want to do exhibitions, town halls, billboards in all 50 states, plus the DC and, um, and, and, the, and Puerto Rico. And, the hopes of being visionary and not reactionary and t turning uh, art spaces into civic spaces. And I think with all of you guys here, with your ideas, uh, we can make the, and your help, we can make this possible. So I noticed that you gave everybody a piece of paper and a pen. Yep. So if, if you can take just five seconds to write down how you think I slash we can help you um, and or how you slash your community thinks you can help us make America great again. Um, <laughs> I believe in the spirit of, of what Paula's piece is, says, um, I, which is really about how we create, we are the Earth's pro we are our biggest problem. When we use single-use plastic, we leave an impression on Earth that we hope someone else will clean up. Um, and we also want to be able to use this. So solo together we can solve this problem. And please, Write it down, leave it in your seat, I'll pick it up myself, or come right here. So please, can we see people who think that they can help Hank on this journey? Like, I'd love to see it. You just all had your hands up. Can we see pink? Is there anybody who has an idea that they want to bring to him? Wait, I'm not calling on anybody. I'm <laughs> asking everyone, I, I'm, I'm serious. You, you want I everyone. want people to help me, or let me help you. All right. I, I'm not gonna, because I don't believe there's one, I want to hear all of your ideas. I heard one idea, and I got greedy. I'm like, I want to hear your idea. Because you said, that's a good idea to her idea, <laughs> to, in response to your idea. And I wanted to hear his idea, and her idea, and your idea. So please, just write it down. And, and if, if people want to know, where there's going to be a, a panel coming up at 8 o'clock for Four Freedoms. And it's about art and creative expression. I'll share with you what I found. I'm taking pictures of it all. And um, there's more collaboration to come. So I'm, I mean, this is how I want to just end this really quickly. Stay up here for a moment. So um, the, the, this is the point, which is that the whole rest of this festival, we want you to be out there finding the ideas where you can actually be helpful. Um, whether it's because you actually write an idea on a card and actually give, give it to somebody, or whether you actually just grab Hank at some moment at a reception and have that conversation, we want you to be doing that. So please keep kind of gathering all the, all the way through and be looking for the best ideas that you can. And we actually have a reception that's all about just getting to have these conversations right now. They don't, they're not all yours. Sorry, Hank. They're, they, they belong to all of us. So, but, yeah. <laughs> can we look at them together? Yeah, we, we definitely can. But, but, but so we'll be gathering them. We'll be putting them up. With that, we want you to go forward and look for ideas in the, in the world. And really, I'd love Kitty to, to go from here. So. so much better. Less work for me and better for everyone. Thank you so much. In the Pepke building and in the Dora Hosier building, we have boards with colorful... Uh, Clips, clip your ideas through the week. We really want to hear from you. We are going to do a lot with the ideas that we collect because we're going to put them on social media and amplify them. And with that, my best idea, first, I have to thank more than me, 
this festival doesn't happen without a lot of people working on it. So Killeen Bretman, our managing director, Brett and all of our content team, our incredible logistics team under Deborah. Thank you all so much. It's really wonderful. And we invite you to a reception in the Dora Hosier building. There are three events tonight. You heard about Four Freedoms. Stay there, go to a movie, go to hear selected shorts in, um, in town, and uh, welcome to Aspen Ideas Festival. <laughs>